3. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is God's word. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Fathers, we come to this your word. We ask that you'll open our hearts to your truth. You know our hearts. You know our joys. You know our fears. You know our struggles. We come to you asking that by the power of your spirit you would meet with us and open to us the riches of your word that we might know you better. Teach us, Father, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Kids, you realize that this evening there will be all kinds of people that will dress up in all kinds of different costumes. They will on some level be kind of transformed into something else. Some will wear very elaborate things, some will wear not so elaborate things, um, and in the process, they will not necessarily dress up for something better. Unfortunately, they'll dress up for something else. Now, now we know today, the world views it as Halloween. And maybe you figured it out, I view today as Reformation Sunday. You'll remember that on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church to be able to try to engage the church in theological beliefs and ideas that he believed the church was missing, they were ignoring, they were actually even dismissing or decrying. And even in his prayer today, Ryan uh, pointed out some of those concerns that Luther had that are very important and very significant. And so often we think about Reformation Day, we think about Luther, one of the most significant things that we think about is the concept of justification by faith alone. That is that we as God's people have been declared righteous by the finished work of Christ and we are justified by faith. We also think in terms of when we look at the Ref at Reformation Day, we think about the solas. And so we think about the five solas. Sola Scriptura, that the Bible alone is really ultimately our authority. Sola Fide, that we are saved by faith alone. Sola Gratia, that it's by grace alone that God has done this work in our hearts. And it's Solus Christus, it's through Christ alone that the salvation comes to us. And Sola Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. So we think about those concepts, we think about Reformation Day, but today we won't really focus so much on justification, but we will look at the concept of sanctification, of God's work in our lives, of what that really means and what that looks like, at least in part. But I want us to look at these verses and we'll see how sanctification comes alive in the midst of these three verses. Think about the fact that it's since the Lord has given us the transforming power of his mercy, we live as those called by him. People will all the time try to do things to, to be different, to look different, to change things. There are guys that don't feel comfortable with their heads and they have to get more hair. I don't understand why. 
Maybe their heads just aren't quite as beautiful. I, I just don't know. There are people that they will change all kinds of things about their appearance. And we want to grow personally and spiritually, but sometimes we just want to try to convince people we're something different than what we are. We act differently, sometimes in different circumstances. And there are places where we can be safe and we can be ourselves, and there are places where we don't feel like we can really do that. Imagine what this was like for the Apostle Paul. He had gone to this church in Corinth. He had gone to Corinth, and we find that in Acts chapter 18, that he had gone to plant a church. We see him as a missionary. We see him as a church planter, that he had gone. But this church began to have other voices, and they began to decide, oh, I like this speaker better than that speaker. And the focus moved away from the glory of God and the work of his kingdom to whether they liked this speaker or not. And it became more human. And so the church had many struggles. So imagine what it would be like for Paul to write to a church where he's got to say a lot of really hard things to them. But notice how he starts. He wants to remind them who they are. They are different now because of what Jesus has done for them. That's really our focus this morning. We who trust in Christ have been transformed. We are being transformed, but we've also been transformed. Let us to see what God does for us. Notice how Paul really begins. He first talks to them about the transforming power of God is unique in the call of God to the Apostle Paul. So he wants to remind them of who he is and his relationship to them in a sense at least. So look at verse 1. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Really it's Paul writing here to the church in Corinth to declare to them God's grace and mercy. But he wants to remind them who he is. And notice that little phrase, called by the will of God to be an apostle. I mean, literally, in the original, it's Paul called an apostle by the will of God. He's an apostle. He has been sent by God to them. But also, it's by the will of God. They heard him. They knew him. You can almost think of it as a catchphrase, a, a technical term that says more than the, the, the words say in themselves, called by the will of God. It would evoke for them what we're here in Acts chapter 9 of Paul's conversion as he went on the road to Damascus to arrest people who believed in Christ Jesus appeared to him from heaven, blinded him in a blinding light, and asked him, why are you persecuting me? And Paul was transformed by the call of God. And so Paul wants to remind them first of who he is, of his call his identity and his call, that he is sent by God, that God is the one who sent Paul to them. This wasn't just a human decision. Paul didn't roll the dice. He didn't flip a coin. He didn't just decide to go here. God sent him here. That would get their attention. That would remind them that God is at work in powerful ways that he's an apostle 
of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So what he is going to tell them is exceedingly important. So they ought to pay attention. And notice Sosthenes, the brother. We don't know for certain, but it's most likely Sosthenes that we find in Acts chapter 18, when the Apostle Paul went to Corinth to proclaim the gospel. And you find him, verse 16, and he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal, but Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Most likely, this is the same Sosthenes, who was the leader of the synagogue. He was a leader. He was viewed highly by these people that he came to faith. This would also capture their attention because it may be that Sosthenes is now with Paul and that they would view him also as carrying a tremendous amount of spiritual weight. This later is going to be really important. And also the fact that in Scripture, the concept of every testimony being by two witnesses may also evoke back from Deuteronomy that sense that we pay careful attention to what Paul is going to say to us. We all have people that we pay attention to. We probably have people we don't listen to. Maybe we have people we're supposed to pay attention to and we don't. Kids we know, we don't talk to strangers. We have to be careful with some people. But we also know that there are people that we really do pay attention to. And here Paul wants this church to recognize God has sent me to you and you need to listen. You need to pay attention. I think we see first in this our view of scripture. Paul is a writer of scripture. We know that there are those who want to try to pit Paul against Jesus. Well, Jesus never said that. We'll go to John 14 and John 16. And John tells us, or Jesus tells us through John, that there are things that they can't yet bear. You'll bear them later through other writers. Peter affirms the writings of Paul. We have to be very careful when people start pitting the Bible against the Bible because they will then ultimately, in their own minds at least, undermine the scripture. When we have something that's hard to understand, then seek help. But the Bible is the word of God. It's the very word of God, so we submit to it. We also recognize that God in his sovereign design sends men to lead us. We have to be under the scripture. It is different. We have to always be on guard not to undermine leadership. There's nothing going on here like that at all. But we always have to be on guard to be careful that we search the scriptures and we see if these things are so. So here the Apostle Paul comes to them to be able to affirm to them, you know me, God called me to come to you. I am, by God's design, one who you are to submit to. That's what he says to that church in effect by declaring who he is. But notice, too, the transforming power of God's life-changing call to his church. He wants them to understand who they are as he begins, because he's going to say some really hard things in this book. So he wants to establish, if you will, a baseline. Don't forget who you are. 
we so easily forget who we are. We so easily forget God's grace. God demonstrates to us time after time after time his answers to prayer, his love, his mercy, the salvation that he gives us in Christ. He shows us all kinds of things and one little thing goes wrong. Oh, Lord, where are you? We forget. We want this to sink in. I want verse 2 to sink in to the church of God that is in Corinth. The church belongs to God. That word in Greek, ekklesia, is a word we get ecclesiastical from. It's a word that the church gravitated away from synagogue to uh, ecclesiastical, that, that concept. Historically, scholars really believe that this probably is kind of the concept, and, and what the word means is kind of a calling out, uh, and that that's what they believe. And that's very likely that that's at least part of what's meant here. But interestingly, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, this word is used for the assembly of God's people, Israel, for the nation of Israel which that even in and of itself shows kind of a picture of an Old Testament church, if you will. But they gravitated toward that word, that they liked that word for whatever reason. So this is really the word that reflects that sense of belonging to God. And that's the way it was in the Septuagint. So for them to sort of take that word is a kind of continuation from Old Testament concepts. So here they are, the church, the people of God, those who belong to God. That shows God's ownership. They belong to him. They are under his authority. They are under his mercy. They are under his love. I'm talking to you who belong to God, Paul says. So he's addressing his, God's people to instruct them. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to notice that word sanctified. We often think of sanctification as a process and we call it progressive sanctification that is that we grow in grace it's not that we aren't saved when we first come to faith in Christ but that we want to grow and mature in Christ but notice Paul doesn't use the word that way he uses it as a past tense sanctified and that is an accurate translation of this word in the original. This word in the original <clears throat> is in the perfect past tense or, or passive tense. You have been sanctified. And so he's talking about what's called definitive sanctification. Often we don't think much about that, but John Murray points out that definitive sanctification is actually more a part of the New Testament and is brought up more often than progressive sanctification, which that's interesting in and of itself. But he wants this church to know that there's an aspect in which sanctification was completed for them at the point of Christ's death on the cross, along with adoption along with justification. And so the righteousness that they receive when they come to faith, when we come to understand the gospel, when we realize Jesus is truly the Son of God, when we see our sin, we see our need for Christ, we see that we are broken people cut off from God, that we are lost and alone, 
God comes by the power of his spirit and he convicts us of our sin. And he opens our eyes and we see the truth and we cry out to him because he makes us alive. And at that point of conversion, we receive justification that the righteousness that Christ earned by a perfect life and his death on the cross as a substitute in our place is given to us. We receive adoption. We are adopted into God's family. We now belong to him. But notice too, we also receive sanctification. We are made completely holy. Not in the sense that we are experientially completely holy. I know you guys, you know me, we're not there yet. But by the finished work of Christ, we are transformed into holiness. Tonight they'll put on costumes. There may be a few angels out there. I don't know. I'm definitely not holding my breath. But God will clothe us, and he already has clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. You are holy by the work of Jesus on the cross. Do you need to grow? Yeah, you do. Do I need to grow? Yeah, I do. But this sanctification is definite and it's given to us at the point of our conversion. We need not fear. We need not be anxious. We need not be afraid. We can know that God's at work in our lives. He knows our struggles. He's not blinded by our continuing sin and our struggles with sin. But we as his people are to put to death the sin nature. But he makes us holy by the finished work of Christ. And this is in part the cry of the Reformation. Churches that want to try to put people under a burden that you have to keep working to try to be acceptable to God, you will never be acceptable to God through your own effort. You'll never live up to God's standard. God's perfect, we're not. One of the funny things about that whole concept is people are trying to work to be better, but God remembers the past. He remembers what I was. Just being better doesn't take away the past. We've all sinned. And some of us worse than others. We're all guilty. We all stand in need of God's grace. To the church of God that is at 79th and Allisonville to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. By God's grace we get to be in the same group. By his grace, not by us.
It's all of him. Notice, this has nothing to do with the church. They haven't earned it. They have no right to it. They don't deserve it. Through the finished work of Christ, he makes them holy. By the finished work of Christ, he makes us holy. And he gives it to us as a gift. Now again, it's also not speaking of perfectionism. There are groups out there that believe that somehow in this life you can attain perfection. There's nothing in the scripture that indicates that. First John, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We never get over confession. We always come back to the Lord time after time after time to ask for his forgiveness and ask for the work of his spirit in our hearts and lives. We never get past our need for Christ. We need him every moment. So they've been sanctified, they've been made holy, but notice that next phrase, called to be saints. To be saints. In other words, for our lives to change. That word is the same root. You've got the noun form here and before you had the verb form. And the idea is they are called to be holy ones. You've been made holy, now live in a holy manner. Pursue that kind of life. Again, the scripture doesn't have certain people that through history have been better than other people for the church and they get raised to the level of saint. We're all saints if we believe in Jesus. And it's because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Jesus. But we are called to be saints. We are called to live transformed lives. And again, Paul is going to say some rough things to this church because they need to hear some things. They have allowed factions and dissensions. They have allowed their own prejudices. They've allowed all kinds of things to sort of weave into the life and the fabric of the way that they do everything. And they are living actively in sin. And Paul is going to call them to repent. But he wants to remind them that they've been made holy by the finished work of Christ. Now live in keeping with what God has done for you. Together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. That's where we come in. That's We're included in that. And it's, it's a present tense. All those who in every place call upon the name and keep on calling upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God never tires of your prayers. God never tires of you coming to him in study, in prayer, in seeking his face, he never gets over having you with him. That's what he says. He wants your heart. He wants you with him. He wants you in prayer. And we all know we don't pray enough in the sense that we could be more in fellowship with the living God. We get busy. We need the Lord. But when you're struggling, 
come back to him time after time after time, and he is delighted that we come to him. We, with all the other saints, call on this same living God time after time. One of my favorite verses occurs a bunch of places in the Bible. Verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I know it's a greeting, but I believe it. Can we grow dull hearing the same thing over and over again? Yeah, if our hearts aren't engaged, we can. But I want you to think about it. Grace to you. This is from God. Grace, God's unmerited favor. Paul, by an apostle, is extending to the church the presence of the grace and the mercy of the living God. God's loving kindness, grace to you who belong to God. Though you are a sinner, though you struggle, though you have weaknesses, though you are not all that you think you should be, though you have all kinds of issues, grace. Grace to you. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, God extends his gracious, ever-present, loving kindness to you in active, real power and presence and peace, shalom. More than just an absence of strife, the presence of the mercy of God, we are at peace with God. Sometimes we struggle, we meet somebody new and we wanna make a good impression, we feel different things with people, we can have anxieties, we can have struggles, we can have fears, we can have all kinds of things that are going on in our lives. But what we want to see and know, we don't ever really have to do that. I know we'll struggle. And so we just keep going back to the living God. But we are at peace with God. There is no strife. There's no battle. There's no difficulty. We are in complete perfect harmony with the living God. So I thought about this. One of the things that came to my mind, here we have this beautiful new piano. It's gorgeous. That piano has to be tuned every so often. Some of us have pianos that we don't tune nearly as often as we should. And when the piano gets out of tune, most of us can kind of tell this isn't right. Some of us, it's like fingernails down a chalkboard. It needs to be tuned. Tune my heart to sing your grace. But on God's end, by his grace, and his work in our hearts, he has us where he wants us to be. And by peace with God, we are in tune with God. Now we still need to grow, but God's at work in our hearts and our lives by his grace. So here he establishes for this church kind of a baseline to remind them who they are. Now we're going to talk about the nitty gritty stuff, but don't forget who you are. Our transforming power doesn't come from changing a costume. It doesn't come by trying to look different. It, it doesn't come by being really careful how we talk to people and how we act. 
our transforming power comes from the inward work of the Holy Spirit that God by his power is transforming us. It comes by the finished work of Christ on the cross so that we have been justified by faith and that we have been made holy by the finished work of Christ and we are called to be saints for the glory of the living God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank and praise you for the gift of life that you've given to us in Christ. How amazing that you make us holy. And it's applied to us. It's not anything that we've done. It's not anything that we deserve. But it comes through Jesus that we're declared righteous and we're also made holy. Now, Father, we pray, give us grace to pursue this calling to be your holy people, to be quick to forgive, to be quick to love, to be grounded firmly in your word and in your truth, that we might truly be living in the fullness of the grace that you have extended to us in Christ. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Closing hymn will be uh, 535.